Well, uh, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to everyone here to our uh, 17th William Pitt uh, seminar. Um, I, I just uh, before I do a little bit of housekeeping uh, stuff, uh, can I first of all scotch the rumour completely that the title who's in charge <laughs> is any reference at all to the UK economy or the UK government. <laughs> the William Pitt uh, Seminar, as most of you will know, is an annual event in our college calendar. It's organised by the Corporate Partnership Programme. The Corporate Partnership Programme is unique amongst uh, Cambridge colleges. There are currently 11 partner businesses uh, who work with the college community in um, uh, developing their own work and enabling us to draw the experience of the world of business and industry into the academic discussions that uh, we have. Um, last year, you will recall uh, we asked the question, uh, what do we want from COP26? The answer, I'm afraid, from COP26 was they didn't provide very many answers. And um, uh, the uh, uh, way in which our thinking developed following that was in the absence of governments around the world taking action, making the decisions which are needed in the face of the climate crisis which uh, uh, we face, who actually is in charge and who should be in charge? What can all of us as individual citizens do? What can NGOs do? What can universities do? What can businesses do in the absence of real leadership from the people who ought, arguably, to be providing it? So that's the starting point for our discussions today. And uh, we want to explore some of those ideas of what all the rest of us can do and how can we take charge of the answers to the climate crisis? Um, uh, I'm uh, thrilled to say that our chair leading us through our discussions today will be Professor Emily Shuckborough. Um, Emily is the director of Cambridge Zero, the University of Cambridge's major climate change initiative. She is also Professor of Environmental Data Science in the Department of Computer Science and Technology. She's a mathematician and climate scientist. She's a Fellow of Darwin College. She's a Fellow of the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, an Associate Fellow of the Centre for Science and Policy, a Fellow of the British Antarctic Survey, and a Fellow of the Royal Meteorological Society. She's Director here in Cambridge of the UKRI Centre for Doctoral Training on the Application of AI to the Study of Environmental Risks. She's Academic Director of the Institute of Computing for Climate Science. She's Co-Director of the Centre for Landscape Re Regeneration. She worked for more than a decade at the British Antarctic Survey, where her work included leading a UK national research programme on the Southern Ocean and its role in climate. Prior to that, she undertook research at École Normale Supérieure in Paris and at MIT. She has also acted as an advisor on climate to the UK government in various capacities, including as a friend of COP26. In 2016, she was awarded an OBE for services to science and the public communication of science. 
She is co-author with King Charles and Tony Jupiter of the Ladybird book on climate change. <laughs> um, she is also the honorary president of the Aldersgate Group. Um, Emily, I sometimes wonder what you do after breakfast. <laughs> um, but uh, Emily, it's wonderful to uh, have you here to help guide us through our discussions this afternoon. Without further ado, over to you. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, so, well, let's start with breakfast, because uh, whilst I imagine that tomorrow morning in breakfast tables across the country, people are going to be asking um, who is in charge. Um, today, we're not so much asking about uh, the UK economy as the uh, future destiny of the, of the planet. And this, uh, this event, this um, William Pitt uh, seminar, sits uh, in the middle of uh, a broader climate change festival that Cambridge Zero is organizing over the next couple of days. And if you're interested in attending any of the events, then please look at the Cambridge Zero website um, to see them. But the broader theme of our climate change festival is climate accessibility. And so very much following on from the comments that, that Chris has made, um, what I very much hope that uh, we will get uh, some discussion this evening is in a much broader sense, not necessarily only in the way that Chris described about in the absence of leadership who um, can be in charge, but perhaps more generally, actually in a, more, in a much more a broader sense, who should be in charge and how can we empower and, um, and enable a very wide range of participants in the decision making about the future destiny of the planet <coughs> and enabling them to take action. So we're going to be hearing um, from an academic perspective, um, not just as to how academic research is um, contributing to solutions around climate change, but how that can be at the heart of a network bringing together a broader range of participants. We're going to hear about the importance of connecting together academic evidence base into the decision making process and we're going to be hearing the critical role that business can play in terms of uh, generating real action at scale that helps to contribute to a better future and a better future is so critically important um, as uh, as chris said this time last year we were sitting weeks ahead of cop 26. All eyes of the world were on us in the UK as hosts of COP26 in Glasgow. And there was real hope that that would be uh, a turning point in terms of international climate action. Sadly, there have been many episodes over the last 30 years that have also been real moments of hope that things would be the turning point in terms of international climate action. Um, and progress has been incremental instead of the accelerated and exponential progress that the science so clearly demands. In the intervening 12 months, we have sadly seen the impacts of climate change starting to take effect across the world. Um, over the summer in the UK, we saw temperatures hit 40 degrees Celsius in numerous places across the country, something that as climate scientists, we never expected to happen this early. Um, terribly shocking. And at the same time, we've seen climate impacts affecting communities around the world. Um, I'll just pick one example of the terrible floods that have been affecting Pakistan over recent weeks and months, and the terrible human impact associated with that. I don't know how many of you have been watching episodes of, of Frozen Planet 2. I have a particular um, polar interest from my time at the British Antarctic Survey. But what's been particularly striking to me is that every time some amazing photography is, is uh, displayed of some unique species or indeed ecosystem, it comes with the, the tail while well, these species or ecosystems are at existential threat as a consequence of climate change. And it really brings home that climate change is no longer a problem of the future, it's a problem very much of today. The other key thing that's come out over the last 12 months has been uh, the three reports from the latest cycle of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, last summer, Working Group 1 on the physical sciences um, produced their report highlighting exactly that the human 
um, impacts associated with, uh, human caused impacts of climate change are now observed in extreme weather and climate uh, impacts in every region across the world. Uh, working Group 2 then reported um, that uh, exceeding 1.5 degrees of warming, and we're already above 1.1 degrees of warming, exceeding 1.5 degrees of warming would inevitably um, increase substantially those threats um, as a, a, a to, to both humans and to um, the natural world. And then Working Group 3 reported um, later in the year <coughs> that if we are to um, address climate change in the way that the Paris Agreement uh, signed countries up to, then that requires deep, rapid, and in almost all instances, immediate cuts in greenhouse gases across every single sector of the economy. So, as we're weeks away from COP27, uh, the next big climate conference, the question is, who is in charge? And how are we going to corral that breadth of global society and global economies to respond to the challenge of climate change with the scale that's required? We'll touch on some of that this evening. Um, and I'm delighted to be able to introduce our very first speaker. Um, Professor Anil Mahadapedi um, is a professor of planetary computing um, in my own department, the computer, uh, Department of Computer Science and Technology here in Cambridge. And he also directs the uh, new Cambridge Centre for Carbon Credits, which uh, I'm sure he'll tell us more about, but um, was launched earlier this year and is a hugely exciting new venture, bringing together multidisciplinary expertise from across the university and connecting with a very important um, potential uh, route to achieving demonstrable change associated with the response to climate change. Um, in, in particular, um, it's aiming to increase the supply of high integrity natural climate solutions, um, helping to contribute towards um, uh, both the response to climate change, but also more, br more broadly um, to biodiversity related um, challenges. Um, Anil, please. Thank you very much, Emily. And uh, thank you, uh, 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 Chris Smith, the Master of Pembroke, for the good news that uh, Liz Truss is definitely not in charge of the climate crisis. Um, I have to, unfortunately, uh, give you the bad news. Uh, the bad news is that we're actually in the middle of three simultaneous crises uh, going on in the world right now. Not just one, not just the climate crisis. So first, there's the one we're familiar with, the, the carbon emissions crisis. And we have to reduce the proliferate emission of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Uh, the United Nations convened the first COP, the first conference of parties on climate change in 1995 to start tackling that particular problem. Uh, but secondly, there's also a biodiversity crisis uh, of species disappearing worldwide. Uh, just this week, the Living Planet report from the WWF revealed that on average, the regularly counted populations of wild species have dropped a staggering 69% since 1970. So there is a United Nations treaty covering biodiversity since 1993. And interestingly, the United States is the only uh, UN member state in the world to not participate in that conference of parties, which is separate from the climate uh, one. And thirdly, we also have desertification. So as climate change wraps up, droughts and uh, uh, disappearing freshwater have resulted in all kinds of difficulties worldwide. And this has been a subject of a COP since 1994. So when we're faced with simultaneous issues of this monumental size and complexity, where do we begin to figure out who's in charge? Well, the first step is to recognize just how interconnected they all are. So human activity drives a big loss in biodiversity, which in turn reduces the carbon sink capacity of our natural ecosystems, and the launch of natural habitats results in desertification and droughts. The second thing is to recognize that international treaties, such as the UN ones, are not resulting in the effective change that we need as quickly uh, uh, as is required to keep our planet livable in the coming decades. So there is no global master plan beyond the United Nations uh, to put this together. Individuals or businesses today uh, can currently take advantage of all kinds of free negative externalities uh, to hide the environmental damage that they're doing uh, through their business practices. In fact, 
it's really quite hard to pin down the eventual impact on any of your consumer decisions on biodiversity or desertification or, or, or climate change. For example, how many people here eat organic food? Just, just put your hands up. So a Swedish study in 2018 showed that um, the climate impact of organic peas, for example, is 50% greater than normal conventional peas. This rises to 70% for organic wheat. Um, the root cause for this difference in climate impact is that the, it's the opportunity cost of land use. If you have lower yields of one hectare of land producing uh, wheat, you need to produce the same food somewhere else, right? And often this extra land comes from the conversion of more biodiverse habitats. So eating organic peas hasn't reduced our total demand for peas, it's just that we need more land to grow the same peas. And thus, the forests get mercilessly chopped down in our quest, for example, for organic food. So this is all bad news so far. The, we humans, we're spreading voraciously across the planet. Uh, we're using up all the resources we depend on. And if things head in the current direction they're going, without a large behavioral shift, uh, we will end up with a hot, dry, depauperate, and def defoliated global landscape. So from a scientific perspective, we're looking for a dramatic edge, something that will help us become really efficient as a society to address all three of these crises simultaneously. So what would an ideal solution look like instead? What we really want um, is a system that provides real-time trustworthy data about the health of the planet. This could then be used by global policymakers, the UN, governments, cities, to come up with strategies that allow humans to live equitably and fairly within our means. And then these policies would ideally guide the global economy uh, with incentives that allow them to prosper without having to resort to planet-killing business practices. But every single one of those ideal steps is extremely complex to get perfectly right. But we have, as a species, shown our capacity to solve these problems before, given suitable motivation. The Montreal Protocol in 1987 is the most successful international agreement to date to uh, stop the depletion of the ozone layer. The construction of the internet as a global superhighway in the last 50 years is another more technological example of the things that we can accomplish together across geographical and political bounds. And luckily, or I wouldn't be quite so optimistic uh, in the way I'm giving you this talk, we have made huge progress in our ability as a species to look at the world holistically as a single unified entity. We have loads of satellites these days that have been launched for decades, which orbit uh, up there and beam data regularly back to us. Uh, and the, our ability to analyze this data has advanced to the point where we can consider the globe to be a single unified uh, space, not divided uh, as it was in the past before we had this data. So we've actually had the ability to build up some of these data sets for decades now. The Landside satellites ha have been launched uh, by NASA from 1984, and they provide multi-spectral visual images across the Earth. So these satellites have been used uh, to build all kinds of deforestation alert platforms in real time, uh, to map the global surface uh, water available throughout the world to combat desertification. And here, for example, we can see uh, one of my favorites. It's really good fun just uh, looking through uh, uh, random uh, Earth snapshots. And, and this is the uh, Equitos River in Peru, uh, where I was in April. And it's the river that snakes. So if you look at it over uh, 30 years, the entire river moves. And it's really quite addictive to, to, to look through uh, some of these um, Earth snapshots and the various platforms that we have, and uh, just to see how beautiful uh, some of the, the images captured from there are, as well as being useful scientifically. And other satellites we've launched, apart from visual ones, are more exotic. The JEDI instrument sits on the International Space Station and is essentially a giant radar in space uh, that uh, sits in the, uh, on the ISS and orbits the Earth continuously. And this is used in, the, uh, in providing estimates of above-ground biomass in such a way that uh, we can actually figure out uh, what the, uh, uh, the total number of trees are in, in, in the world. Let me see if I can get this playing. So I'll just leave that running. While I talk, you can see how the, uh, the, the instrument uh, takes an east-west orbit and uh, eventually blankets the entire Earth. So beyond this current generation of satellites, there are even more accurate and exciting launches being uh, happening all the time. Uh, the biomass satellite, for example, is one that has been under preparation since 2013, and it's the first to use what's known as a P-band frequency that uh, can penetrate through forest canopies and provide a full snapshot of forest health, not just the very top of it. And biomass uh, is pushing the boundaries of what is politically possible. It actually is also used, uh, the frequency range, by military 
early defense warning system. So we're only allowed to fly that satellite over the tropics and not anywhere where uh, NATO might be unable to uh, then spot any missiles uh, flying across the planet. So negotiating all these is also a, a complex process. But all of these satellites, in summary, do give us an edge in our quest to form a global snapshot of planetary health. So when combined with modern cloud computing platforms, uh, we can bring enormous compute capacity to bear as well, and we can process all of this gathered data, uh, and we can distill it down into natural intelligence that's global. And we can use that to inform governments and businesses about the consequences of our actions. So that would be the conventional academic thing to do. Just give the data out there and just forget about it. But we don't have time just to do that. So we can do one thing better. We can speed things up uh, by building integrated digital platforms that accelerate the rate of adoption of some of uh, this data. Uh, and we do this by providing open and transparent access to this information to citizens uh, and, and businesses all over the world. Let me give you an example of one such thing that we're trying to build here in the Cambridge Center for Carbon Credits uh, that uh, Emily just mentioned. How many people here have purchased carbon offsets when you, when you fly, clicking in that little box on, on EasyJet or whatever? So, so maybe, uh, maybe uh, I'd say a quarter of you. Uh, the big idea about carbon credits is that we want to balance the climate, climate damage that happens from our uh, actions uh, along with uh, some sort of uh, climate benefits via some other uh, 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 system that avoids or captures uh, uh, our emissions. So if a flight causes a certain amount of, of damage, then there should be something else that balances that out. So how do we realize these climate benefits? Because we know how to cause the climate damage. Uh, and one way is to realize it is by creating projects which focus on natural landscape preservation or regeneration. And in turn, this will result in the avoidance of deforestation that might otherwise occur. So remember, tropical rainforests are disappearing at an astonishing rate of about 0.5% per year. They're responsible for two thirds of the world's uh, Earth's biodiversity and they cover less than 10% of the land mass. So we really wanna provide immediate incentives uh, to stop these from being chopped down in the name of low efficiency agriculture. The opportunity cost is huge. But carbon credits, which are a mechanism to get finance to these projects, are also deeply controversial in their current incarnation. And this is for a very simple reason. When you click that box on, e on the EasyJet site, you have no idea and no way to verify that the money you're giving uh, uh, the people who are causing the damage is actually going towards projects that are actually effective and resulting in real uh, 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 climate uh, benefit. So there are papers emerging now in the scientific literature that have examined what's called the additionality of, uh, of many of these projects, that is, uh, how much impact are they having uh, if, uh, in it, if, if they didn't happen, and they're showing that they're not as effective as claimed. So this in turn means that we have an imbalance between the climate damage that we're causing and the benefit of what we're offsetting. The whole carbon credit system fails if it doesn't balance the atmospheric books. Right? Um, we will just continue to use them as indulgences and not actually uh, uh, reduce our overall emissions. So what we're trying to do in 4C, uh, as an example of trying to close this scientific loop, is trying to preserve tropical rainforests but more trustworthy form of these credits that are verifiable. So the University of Cambridge uh, is launching an offsetting scheme based on the principle that all of the emission reduction claims that we make uh, or avoidance claims must be backed by independent digital analysis from global satellite data. We can crunch all of the vast data available from, from what you saw uh, uh, from Landsat, from Sentinel, from all kinds of uh, NASA and ESA satellites, and then make accurate statistical claims about how good uh, the avoided deforestation rates claims are, and then also uh, try to establish how permanent the resulting uh, impacts of those projects were as soon as, um, as, soon as uh, uh, you can, you, the project uh, uh, area has ended. Um, I, think, I think the PowerPoint has, has given up, so I, I won't bother uh, showing you some of those graphs. But uh, I can certainly show you some of the data platforms that we built after this talk. And then once you perform these digital computations so that we know that these projects we're investing in um, have some verifiable credibility based on satellite data, we try to publish them openly so that they're available for reproduction and testing by, by skeptical third parties. We record our actual carbon usage, the, the retirements of these offsets, onto efficient distributed ledgers like Tezos. Uh, and this in turn allows the University of Cambridge and, its, and eventually its colleges, which is about 40,000 uh, staff and students, 
uh, to confidently and, and uh, hopefully in a trustworthy and transparent way make claims about uh, how we can uh, make reparations for uh, the necessary carbon emissions that we have at the moment. So this scheme doesn't try to solve the whole set of problems. It doesn't cover all of our emissions or solve the problem of reducing our dependency on, on fossil fuels. It's only tackling that specific area, for example, of, of flights. But it does at least give us a direct action way of making transparent progress towards solving one part of it. And by selecting the highest impact projects we can get, tropical uh, deforestation avoidance, this has positive impacts towards the carbon emissions crisis, the biodiversity crisis, the desertification crisis. So it's, it's a bargain when you look at it in terms of uh, uh, if, if, if there's a, a huge, if your house is on fire, you, you don't try to build in redecorators and plant some new forests. Uh, while, while, while the house is burning, you, you stop the, the death of the old growth forests, you stabilize that, uh, and then you can start looking into uh, anything else that's, uh, that's less urgent. So this is an example of one such mechanism we're trying. Obviously, we're, we're, we're going to try many, many more. And to come back to the original question, who is in charge uh, of taking all this data? Well, we all are. We all have different roles to play. There's no point looking for uh, a, a global master plan in the sky. This existence of open data, of open computation platforms, has actually given us all agency to work towards influencing these global goals that we need to get to. To the researchers in the audience, uh, you can take advantage of these platforms, as many of them are freely available and hugely scalable. If you need help, grab the nearest computer scientist and essentially force them to help you, because uh, this is one of, the, I think, the highest impact things that computer scientists can do right now in terms of our research and publish results openly and make sure that climate accessibility is available to everyone. This is the, the theme of the climate festival that, that Emily just told us about. And to the educators here, the, the, the lecturers in, in the department, place climate education at the heart of our curriculums across all subjects, from economics to social sciences to history, natural sciences to philosophy to the ethics of climate justice. All of these we have, to, we have to tie together, not just technology, to make sure that we have all the pieces of this, of this complicated puzzle. In computer science, for example, as Emily mentioned, we've just launched the Energy and Environment Group uh, to highlight our focus and commitment uh, to working with other disciplines uh, in this space. And to the policymakers, you, you have to guide us in making sure that the data that you need to make your decisions is accessible and understandable uh, uh, and is in the right format that you need, and then help us translate that into meaningful and long-lasting policy. So it may seem implausible with the, with the current state of UK politics, but we, it's vital that we keep up constant pressure uh, through evidence-based science uh, from the voting populations to keep climate uh, biodiversity and desertification at the top of the political agenda. And to the businesses and startup funders here, we're going we're to hear from Greg shortly, uh, but take advantage of any such resulting policies and disrupt the status quo. We have a really rich startup culture, especially here in Cambridge, and these will hopefully lead us into a balanced, uh, environmentally friendly new economy. The climate platforms available will give your startups a huge edge compared to more conventional established businesses, and there's going to be nothing in the world economy unaffected by climate change. There are trillions of dollars being invested into this space, and with that is the ability to do social good, but also just raw opportunity for all of you uh, starting to make your careers. And finally, the students in the audience, who are the students here who are, who are studying for a degree? So about, about a, a, a good a quarter or a third of you are here. You are in the greatest university in the world for interdisciplinary collaborations. So, and your ambitions should span uh, the globe and match your potential. Uh, you have been selected uh, from a large uh, cadre of, 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 of applicants to be here. But the structure of Cambridge, with our departments, our schools, our colleges, they help you, they exist, not just for fancy dinners and, 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 uh, and, and nice wine, but to find colleagues across disciplines and to make those connections so you can build the strongest intellectual fabric that you can have to solve the specific climate problem that you want to. I do not believe that the answers lie in any one discipline anymore. They lie across the intersection of old school uh, disciplines, uh, and then we can put them all together uh, to help uh, tackle this very, very large and, uh, and, and, and scary uh, set of crises that we have right now. Professors like uh, myself and Emily, we're here to guide you, but ultimately, the students are the, the problem solvers of the future. So I've given you a whirlwind tour into what my view on science is. We have all these new platforms available, and now our job is to figure out how do we weave, it, weave this fabric together into, a, into an emergent system that can start to tackle these problems. And by using transparency and open data as the basic 
techniques we have of checking that we're actually succeeding, and then supply that to policymakers, and, and, and supply that to businesses, and try to uh, guide the incentives in the right direction. I'm looking forward to continuing the discussion in the panel, uh, and also later on at dinner and throughout the Climate Festival uh, this weekend. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Lord Ashby. Her name which may mean something to some of you here. And before I go any further, I just want to express my gratitude <coughs> to Eric. If it had not been for the, um, the, the, the deep uh, uh, introduction that he gave me to environmental issues, environmental science, that time uh, when I was a, a, actually a master's student here, I would not be here now. I, I, I'm immensely grateful for the insights that he gave me. He also wrote what I think is still the best book that discusses the issues around the interface between environment and policy making. Um, okay, it has the rather unfortunate non-PC title of Reconciling Man with the Environment. But I do recommend it to you. Uh, as, as I say, it written, I think, in 1978. It has not been bettered, I think. And, and it's an indication, I think, of the stature of that man. One of the other things that Eric did uh, was he became the first chairman of the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution, um, a body which survived until the coalition government, I think in 2011, uh, for, for ridiculous reasons, it seems to me, decided to um, withdraw its funding. Uh, a great tragedy, and I think we'd be a lot further ahead uh, in a lot of our analysis if the Commission had continued to exist. Anyway, um, the Commission uh, survived for 25 years or more, and on its 25th anniversary it decided to have a seminar, um, and they came to me, organisers came to me and said, David... We'd like you to wrap up the, um, e the afternoon's uh, events by talking about the next hundred years. <laughs> oh, and you've got ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I said, mm, oh, right. Um, and I feel a bit like that today, <laughs> you know, the amount of compression uh, that I am going to have to do it is slightly ominous. So I thought I'd try and sort of emulate a cat. It's not presumptuous. A oh, Catherine will. And I'd sort of fling out a few ideas, um, and you can um, have great fun uh, attacking uh, some of them or agreeing with them, if you surprise me if you do. Um, I hope, you know, those Catherine wills, they spin around for a few, just a few seconds, and then they sort of fizzle out, don't they? I hope I'm not going to fizzle out, and I hope to end <laughs> with a bit of a one, one particular thing. I hope I'm not going to be a damp squid. But that's what I thought I'd do. I'm not going to talk about uh, adaptation to climate change. And, and sorry, this is a bit of an in-joke for Chris. This is the uh, benighted village of uh, Haysborough uh, in Norfolk, um, which is suffering from the ravages of the North Sea. Uh, and, of course, there's a huge debate about uh, adaptation to climate change. And I've done quite a lot of work in, over the years on that myself. But I'm not going to talk about adaptation issues. Uh, although I think they are critically important. Maybe they can come up, come up in, in, in discussion. Um, yeah, I mean, coming back to your, your presentation, Anna, yeah, you said there were these three overlapping crises, the carbon crisis, biodiversity, desertification. Um, well, um, the, is this the good news or the bad news? There's more. I mean, oh, yes, I mean, yes. I mean, for, you know, there, there is, for example, the, the, the issue of health. The global, and, and, you know, this was around long before we had the terrible circumstances of the past two to three years. Um, perhaps you were incorporating this and on what you're saying, but, of course, there's also the food crisis, uh, or the food issue, at least. And then if you cut things in a different way... <coughs> I mean, I, I sometimes feel that, that the whole question of the future of the oceans as a, you know, a, 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 an environmental entity, a trope, or whatever you want to call it, um, may be actually the most profound face of humanity. And again, that might come up in discussion. Um, so I, I, I might al almost say you can perhaps ask, is climate in all circumstances, 
the most important problematic that we face. It clearly is critically important. Um, I have to admit, I say this to the audience, I'm just a little bit nervous about the use of terms like the climate catastrophe, the climate apocalypse. Um, you know, the Guardian is particularly fond of, of these terms. I, I sort of rein it back a bit, and I, I like to talk a little bit less dramatically about the climate issue. Now, you might think that I'm sort of being a bit too stepping back there. Um, but uh, I think when one thinks about it with this uh, the approach of science, that perhaps a little bit of that non-polemical discussion, or non-polemical labelling, categorisation, might be of value. But clearly, I mean, you know, things are going on. We've already had reference to, to this. I mean, it's indisputable. Uh, I think I couldn't get a picture of the actual day. It was last year, 2000, I think July the 19th, not the 18th, that we had the record breaking temperature. Uh, that's the, the synoptical the temperature picture from Northwest Europe uh, uh, on the 18th. And, and I mean, it, it's clear that something uh, is going on. Uh, <laughs> if we go beyond that, and then the debate about is the climate becoming more active, uh, you know, and, and one can make clearly very strong uh, uh, scientific uh, and, uh, interlinkages between uh, temperature rises and the more active climate. Um, and then when we start to get into areas where there perhaps is less certainty about the, the interlinks, um, you know, storm Arwen, you know, just an example which had a great deal of public uh, awareness and press publicity. Um, and, and I think we need to do a lot more work on the link between climate change and uh, extreme weather events of, of all forms. But now I want to shift gear, if I may, and start to speak about the presentation of policy. Um, and yes, uh, in, in my um, time at... Uh, uh, the House of Parliament in particular, uh, I, I was um, particularly interested in the application of you know, cost-benefit analysis to climate change. And I'd, I'm slightly worried that there doesn't seem to be perhaps quite as much discussion uh, recently of these sort of uh, uh, um, you know, cost-impact uh, 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 This is meant to Oh, good. Sorry, it, it's not really a point of the way I thought. Uh, it's not. Um, and, and, and just to fill in very quickly, you know, these, these show the amount of carbon that can be abated by different strategies uh, and the cost. Cost uh, uh, ranked along the, um, the, the x-axis and the amounts along the y. And some, just to explain to people who are not familiar, some are actually... Uh, not just cost less, but they actually have net benefits. They're what you might call free lunches, because you'll get additional non-climate-related benefits uh, that come from adopting them. And then the others to the right um, involve considerably higher amounts, uh, higher costs per tonne of carbon abated. And you can see some interesting <coughs> ones there, one which I've spent a lot of time on. For example, um, coal carbon capture and storage. Now, again, I don't have time to go into details, but I think that carbon capture and storage, at least on, 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 on power plants and other sources, is a bit of a red herring by and large uh, and is probably not worth pursuing too much. I, I know that's how it could be for some people highly controversial saying that, but uh, uh, I've said it. They are subject for, di for discussion. Um, The, the other issue I thought I'd sort of throw off in this Catherine Wheelie way um, is that clearly uh, the whole question of, and Anil has alluded to this, the whole question of developing adequate strategies uh, is international, although there's scales, uh, obviously, and you know, uh, different scales of land area, 
the dominant issue may be, say, in one case, biodiversity. If you expand out to larger areas, then it might be, you know, the, 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 the question of um, uh, uh, desertification or something like, like that. Um, but clearly, the whole issue of debating adequately uh, the impact and hopefully the, you know, the resolution of climate change is international. Now, I can hear you, I can always hear the mutterings in the room. We come to this event, and there's a speaker who's telling us that climate change is international. Wow, wow. Uh, God, I didn't know that, you're all thinking. But uh, there, there are some dimensions to this uh, which I think are, deserve a, a little bit of, a bit of emphasis. Um, and one of them... <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's indisputable that there will be some positive impacts in some areas from climate change. But it's not that that I'm really trying to make this point about. Uh, and it's a point which was particularly poignant in the context we find ourselves. But I think in the case of both Russia and also um, China, We cannot, we, we will not succeed unless at least both those countries are fully integrated into the uh, debate on and the development and implementation uh, of policies. And it worries me, I'll be honest with you, uh, that there's certain sort of mindsets, not just in this country, but certainly in this country, that are perhaps excluding and again, I realise I'm treading on very dangerous ground here, but I, you know, I personally hope that when it's all over, and God may it come soon, and, and, and people, you know, that, that Russia, for example, can be integrated as quickly as it's feasible into the debate again. Because, apart from anything else, uh, if I can go back on these slides, I mean, that is a picture from Siberia, the great rivers, but uh, of, the, of, of the tundra area, but um, as well, the huge area of boreal forest. Now, the tropical forest gets all the focus, but the management and impact of, of, of the boreal forest uh, in climate change is, is as possibly in some areas, e e even more important. Um, so I do want to make, make that em em point about um, the need to have uh, international action, and I want to emphasize it even more. It surprises me that in this country, and how, how am I on time? My watch is still. Well, finishing. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> that, that there isn't so much discussion of the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals uh, as occurs in some countries. Um, why not so we don't have time to debate? I'm, I'm sure this audience will be very familiar with them. And it seems to me that they provide overall the framework for the development of policy. I mean, climate change is one particular, but also it interacts with so many of the others. Um, and that, and let me say again, the United Nations provides uh, the answer. Now, I, I know you're also well informed. You've all read the editorial in yesterday's issue of Nature, haven't you? <laughs> well, I do urge you, if you haven't, to read it because there is a, the urging of the development of a new function within the UN uh, to promote not just on climate change but to raise the uh, caliber and quantity of advice to decision makers, international decision makers, on scientific issues, certainly including climate change. Um, and th there is no alternative, ladies and gentlemen. It has to be through the United Nations. There isn't time to invent any other great international agency. And it saddens me that the UN, there's been this sort of trope, this meme, 
to, to intend to discount, devalue the UN. We have to defeat this. We, you know, I get a bit angry, and I'm going to be a bit angry. We have to defeat Trumpism and all that goes with it. This this attitude of rejecting the international, the international collaboration. We won't get anywhere uh, unless we do. And to finish, because I know I must finish. Um, it, it is the UN or nothing. Uh, I mean, I, I, I love this cartoon and I use it in so many of my presentations. Uh, it's not perfect, the UN, I'm fully aware of all the issues. But, you know, as the old cartoon said, if you know there's a better hole in the UN, well, go to it. <laughs> so that, ladies and gentlemen, is my urging to you uh, as I finish my presentation. Thank you very much, David, and thank you in particular for uh, reminding us that climate sits at the heart of so many other global challenges, and uh, you know it's so intimately connected with all the rest of the sustainable development goals that you highlighted um, there. Now, of course, at a very um, immediate sense, climate change is also intimately connected, um, both with um, the energy crisis and the cost of living crisis. Um, and our next speaker, Greg Jackson, is um, CEO of Octopus Energy um, Group. Launched in 2016, Octopus Energy um, has a mission to bring cheaper, greener power to all through, uh, through technology. Um, Greg uh, is a key thought leader in, in the UK in issues related to the energy um, transformation, but also in, more generally into, into the discussion as to how we do provide um, clean energy to, to all. Um, he has a, a, a really um, exciting, uh, I guess, history. Um, I'm going to get accused of, <laughs> of giving too long a history again. But in terms of being an angel investment in startups, as well as the work that he's been doing um, with um, Octopus Energy. So it's a real privilege to have you um, here with us today, Greg. Um, I'll leave you to, to, to present. Thank you. Um... <laughs> First of all, I should say, I think it's 30 years to the month since I was last in a Cambridge lecture hall. <laughs> and that's unfortunate because um, obviously it's the beginning of term. Uh, it's even more unfortunate that um, it was a, at least a year before I graduated. So um, <laughs> <laughs> forgive me, because <laughs> I don't actually know what, what good is, um, apart from what I've just seen from, from both Anna and David. Uh, and and uh, Anna, you started by saying there were three crises. Emily just nicked them off me because you had your three and I was going to talk like we've got the climate crisis and I think it is a crisis, we can talk about that. Um, uh, but we've also got the cost of living crisis and we've got the national security crisis. And they really do intersect, uh, uh, for me, around the world of energy. Um, uh, very briefly, I'll talk about the national security crisis. Uh, you know, we should not forget that our addiction to fossil fuels is not only what funds uh, Putin's war in Ukraine. It's what gives him astonishing leverage in the execution of that war. Now, that's possibly the worst example in my lifetime of the uh, incredibly negative impacts that our addiction to fossil fuels have had beyond, beside the climate crisis. But it's a great example, and I, and I think it's important to note that because the opening question was who's in charge? And, uh, you know, uh, look, I think there's good news here and there's bad news. Um, but to far too great an extent, we have a world in which the incumbent interests of, for example, the fossil fuel industry are broadly in charge at the moment. It doesn't have to be like that, and the world will be better if it's not like that. And we have every chance of making it not like that. Um, this is the nth fossil fuel crisis of my life. I grew up in the 1970s. We had you know, dinner by candlelight and you know, ate from a camping stove during one of the fossil fuel crises of, of that era. And um, uh, the challenge was that back then we didn't really have an alternative. But today we do. Thanks to the investments 
made by governments and societies around the world. We now live in a period when uh, renewable energy is cheaper than fossil fuels. It was cheaper prior to this crisis, but today in the UK, it costs nine times more to generate electricity from gas than it does renewably. And the cost of renewables is falling every single year. The cost of solar generation is 200 times less than it was 40 years ago. Um, we can talk a little bit about where some of these come from, but I love, I love the, the chart you showed, David, that had carbon capture and storage on it, right? So forgive me, I'm going to skip around a few topics and hope you can knit them together into a narrative because I failed to do so, but the topics are critical. <laughs> um, you asked that question about carbon capture and storage. You said it, it may be a distraction. I would go further and I would say it's definitively horseshit, right? <laughs> um, if anybody works in it, I'm really, really, really sorry. And I look forward to you proving me wrong. But um, a great example of the thinking that leads to that, right, is um, yesterday I was privileged enough to be around a table with some of the most senior executives in Europe uh, from the oil and gas sector and some of their investors. Uh, and I was a little bit early for my session. So I caught the tail end of the one before me. And uh, it was from a technology company specialising in creating technologies for the oil and gas sector. And he said, look, the reality is we're still going to be using, uh, we're going to be increasing our use of oil and gas right up to the 2050s. He said, look, the problem is not oil and gas. He said, it's the emissions from oil and gas. Right? If we can sort out the emissions, then oil and gas can be good. Okay? Now, I, I was looking to go straight after him. So, so I was able to start by just making the following observation that, look, the reason we're addicted to oil and gas is it's a cheap and convenient form of energy. Um, if we have to deal with the emissions, it ceases to be cheap and convenient. And at that moment, other forms of energy may well be better, particularly as for electrification, they're already better. So, so what is holding back change? Because the economics is clear. Right? The economics is that, certainly for electricity, electricity from renewables is cheaper than from fossil fuels. And magic happens when you electrify things. Uh, at the moment, the UK is having a bit of a debate about how we decarbonise heating. There are two main possibilities. One is electric heat pumps, and the other is uh, the piping of hydrogen to homes and then burning it. Uh, now, hydrogen can come from one of two sources. By the way, I should say, it's standing right back, right? Occasionally, I get accused, like, octopus have got a dog in this camp, you're not independent. The reality is, a couple of years ago, yeah, Ultimus is, defined, is often described as a clean energy company. And yet, a couple of years ago, I sat and had a sort of fairly honest word with myself, which was that we sell gas to millions of homes. We're probably in the top 10, certainly the top 20 carbon emitters in Britain. So I stand here to you to, in front of you today as quite a criminal. Okay? But I, I had to ask that question. I said, like, what do we do about this? All right? Because if, we, if, if I stop selling gas today, everyone on this picture has got gas bottles going elsewhere. Um, but if, if I don't stop selling gas, then you know, I'm, I'm running a massive carbon criminal operation. So uh, we looked at what you can do to decarbonize heating. And when you look at it, um, you've got those two routes. Hydrogen can really come from one of two sources. <coughs> Hydrogen can come from electrolysis, uh, in which case you start with green electricity, you use it to electrolyze water, and that creates hydrogen, it's very clean. Um, or it can come from what we call blue hydrogen, that's where you take methane, natural gas, and instead of burning it, you run a bunch of processes upon it, separate the hydrogen out, leaves it in carbon dioxide, back to CCS, you've got to do some of the carbon dioxide, but let's assume you do some of the carbon dioxide, you're going to take the hydrogen, pump it to people's homes and burn it. Um, uh, now, the, the, the challenge with both of those is if you think about it, they're very expensive. Let's look at heat pumps, I'll tell you about that in a second. If you look at heat pumps, a heat pump takes one kilowatt hour of electricity and through some sort of miracle that you know, defies science, turns it into three or maybe four kilowatt hours of heat. Right? Um, it's not really defying science, by the way. It's called a heat pump because it's moving heat from one place, the outside world, to another, inside your house. Um, and so the energy isn't used, you're not releasing energy from the electricity, you're using electricity to move energy. Thus you achieve this phenomenal three or four hundred percent efficiency. So back to hydrogen. If you're making green hydrogen, you start with electricity, and then you do a bunch of stuff and you get some hydrogen out of it, compress it, pump it to people's homes and burn it. The most you could ever get from that would be one-to-one, -one, but because of all the processes, it's about 50% efficient. Six times more expensive than a heat pump. And that's being optimistic for hydrogen. 
or you have blue hydrogen where you take the methane and all that stuff. That is necessarily more expensive than gas because you start with gas, then you're doing a ton of stuff to it. And today, gas is nine times more expensive than electricity. Per unit. Right. However, we look at it, so I got the bus light on there, but the, yeah, the point there is no way in which those are good solutions. So, why is Britain currently investing £22 billion replacing our metal pipe network for gas with a plastic one ready for hydrogen? All right? Why is that? Is it because there's 120 hydrogen lobbyists? in the Houses of Parliament, we've got roughly 600 MPs, right? Roughly one lobbyist for every five of them. Now, that's not, I'm not being sort of paranoid and conspiratorial. It's understanding the power of incumbency. Because the power of incumbency is that, you know, our society has been so dependent on oil and gas for decades that they have, quite understandably, a revolving door with policymakers. And their view of the world necessarily is one in which their product it's the very centre of it. And, and the well-meaning people there would like their products to carry on being the centre of it, and they'd love it to stop doing the damage. But if you don't have that heritage and you look from the outside, it's madness. Absolute madness. And, and, and at the beginning, I, I was kind of described as going to be, you know, talk about this from a business perspective. And, and I can say very honestly, business is neither good nor bad. Um, business is an incredibly effective machine for delivering against some objective function. And that objective function will typically, in the long run, be some measure of profit. And the challenge we have today is it's just dramatically more profitable to be an oil and gas company than it is to be a company that are driving change. And that's because we have a system built around oil and gas. And that system is not just the infrastructure. Those pipes that really ought to be just abandoned, you know, maybe we'll find some of the use of them, but we shouldn't be pumping acid down them. Um, or the infrastructure of the ability to lobby and drive policy. During the debate in the UK about whether or not it's right to have a windfall tax, one of the strongest arguments that was made against the windfall tax on oil and gas companies was, we need them to make those profits so they can invest in the future. <laughs> but that's a bit like asking you know, Kodak to invest in, they, they didn't get digital photography. It's like asking Blockbuster to invest in streaming and Netflix, they didn't get it. Um, the DNA is wrong. So what we really need to do is to begin that process that makes the clean solutions cheaper than the dirty ones. And this is where, you know, I think we can get back to a bit of good news, right? So at the exact same time as we're developing the renewable technologies that are cheaper to generate dramatically than from fossil fuels, uh, so we're also getting new forms of energy consumption. I mean, the most obvious is electric vehicles. And an electric vehicle, a typical electric car, holds enough electricity in its battery to power a house for four or five days, all right? Um, so when people talk about the problem with uh, renewables is intermittency, right? And we, we can't cope, we, we, you know, that's like for like thinking, it's incumbency thinking. Actually, if you, if you imagine we'd never have fossil fuels in the first place as a society, humans are really fucking inventive, right? Sorry for language. Humans are really inventive. And there is no doubt we would have found ways to tap into these sources of energy and create pretty much the society we have today. But that society would be one that didn't lead to potentially, however we describe it, serious climate issues. Um, oh, catastrophic climate change, perhaps. Um, it'd be one in which you didn't have 30,000 people in the year dying from uh, uh, dying early because of the impacts of local air pollution and particulates. But it would also be quieter, right? Yeah. Everything would be better. And we've now got the chance to invent that world. But we need the institutions and the markets to do so. So just a couple more thoughts on this, right? Um, first of all, the obvious thing, right, is we should be taxing carbon, right? We, we shouldn't be choosing winners and saying, oh, we need a hydrogen economy or we need big batteries. We just tax carbon, tax it, and keep putting the taxes up and allow the inventiveness of business, not expecting any moral judgment, just the inventiveness of business to create the solutions that don't attract those taxes. I don't know whether you all know this, but it's bonkers that in the UK, until roughly a few weeks ago, uh, the vast majority of climate taxes on energy were placed on electricity, which is increasingly clean, is the only way we'll clean things up. And gas was virtually tax-free. Um, that's been temporarily suspended, but it's only temporary, and chances are, unless things change, that's gonna come back. So we're taxing the good stuff, and we're not taxing the bad stuff, right? Um, uh, the other thing we need to do uh, is we need to deal with the, the challenge of regulation. Regulations put in place to protect society and consumers, but the reality is 
the people who spend the most money, put the most brains into defining regulation, influencing regulation, are the very companies that, that, that uh, are sought to be regulated. Um, and so uh, if, if we look at, uh, a great example for me is what's happened in telecoms, right? Uh, some of you might have been around in the 1980s. Uh, back in the 1980s, uh, the, the, we had a nationalized telecom, telecom company, British Telecom, and um, one of the things about it was uh, you could only get two models of phone. There was the big one, and then there was a really sexy slim one. That was it. And um, they were the only phones you could plug in in your house. Um, and in fact, at one point, you had to get an engineer to do it. And then through some deregulatory nonsense, uh, the market was opened up, and the British telephone people said, look, you, know, you can't plug in other phones. It'll frazzle the system. And, and yet, within a couple of years, there were a plethora of new, of course, it's just phones, it's not important. The point is, it didn't frazzle the system. If you get solar panels on your house today, I think you need 11 separate documents before we're allowed to pay you for the solar energy you generate. Right? It'll take 6 to 12 weeks, and that's only if every document gets supplied, which, by the way, roughly 10 20% of the time they don't, before we can pay you for your energy. All right? And when we, that's because, by the way, you know, the grid say, well, you might frazzle our system. It's not complicated, right? In fact, the solar panel's there anyway, you, whether you've got the documents or not. Right? So we should be able to measure electricity's coming and pay for it. But the inordinate amount of regulation there prevents that happening. It's one of the many bits of friction. Uh, in fact, if you, um, I was talking to the deputy CEO of Ofgem, and I said, look, you know, if we've got two customers living next to each other, this is quite a crisis. Um, uh, one of them's got solar panels. We'll pay them five pence a unit for what they generate. That's more than we pay, it's about 20% more than we pay grid generators. By the time it's next door, it costs 17 pence. It's gone up three and a half fold in price. I said, it'd be cheaper to put my own wire in. And he said, yeah, but I'll have to prosecute you. Because that's the nature of the regulation in the energy sector. Um, at the moment, uh, there's a bit of talk in the press about the fact it takes a year to build a wind farm, less than a year to do the engineering for a large wind farm. It takes seven years to deal with the bureaucracy, right? And, and people think that's planning. There's a bit of that, and there's certainly some NIMBYs, and there's lots of government things, all of which can be dealt with. The main problem in that seven years, though, is trying to get a grid connection. Because National Grid, as a regulated monopoly, works for a bunch of service agreements that were designed two or three decades ago when no one could imagine that you'd want this plethora of new, clean, cheap, resilient, nationally secure energy generation. But the systems are not moving to meet the needs of the times. So we need two things. One is we need uh, really, really um, the sort of universal carbon taxes. And the other is we need a and forgive me for this, because as a business, I'm not saying for evil reasons, but we really do need a massive deregulation of the system. Uh, there are trillions of dollars, I think Angle said it, there are trillions of dollars of investment waiting to be made in clean energy, but there are zero routes to market. Today in Scotland, I mean, not necessarily today, it might be, uh, when it's windy, even during the crisis when we have a shortage of energy, and energy prices are so high, people can't pay their bills, and the government has to spend 100 billion pounds just to support them. If it's windy, we turn off the wind farms in Scotland because we haven't got enough cables to bring the electricity to England. We're building, I think, 80 gigawatts of offshore wind. By the way, no one knows what a gigawatt is. It's a lot. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but we haven't got the cables to bring it ashore, right? Because of this regulated system. So what we really need now is contestability and competition alongside sensible taxes so we can unleash innovation to drive a much cleaner system, faster and cheaper than anyone imagines. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. Now, I would like to invite each of the panellists to come up, and we're going to have a discussion for the next uh, just under half an hour. Um, we'll then have a break whilst you can all be formulating your questions that you would like to ask the panellists in the second half. But first of all, please, panellists. Right, so um, the title of this whole session is uh, Who's in Charge? So I thought, as, uh, as the first question, that uh, I might ask each of you if you were in charge, and who, who knows, we might wake up tomorrow morning and find there's a vacancy now, not just as the <laughs> Chancellor, but as the Prime Minister. If you were in charge, what single thing would you prioritise doing? 
um, to respond to climate challenge? Anil. Ooh, so, luckily, I'm, I'm, I'm Irish Indian, so I, I will not be Prime Minister of the UK. I, I'm not sure <laughs> what, 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 what the rules are. Um, but it, 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 it's clear to me that uh, it's uh, what, what David said. We have to move to more uh, science and evidence-based policy making. It seems really, really obvious, but we have let that land by the wayside. So fundamental investments um, in the actual evidence that we're gathering uh, and those interdisciplinary collaborations has been has been plummeting. And since Brexit, we've uh, we've we've lost access to huge amounts of European funding. So we cannot take an international position without a very solid long-term commitment from the government uh, into large disruptive uh, in innovations. DARPA, the, the, the military wing of, of the United States, um, invests hundreds of billions of dollars a year into really crazy ideas because their, 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 their idea is that you want to take, first of all, impossible ideas, uh, turn those into improbable ideas, and then turn those into inevitable ideas. And so they take about $10 billion per program uh, in order to shift things from those uh, and that's where the internet came from. That's when many of those satellite launches uh, you saw came from. They were originally seeded into, into moving across this. The United Kingdom has uh, a depth of concentrated ability to do this, but none of the, the sustained uh, and, and, and bold financial investment. Uh, instead, we have track and trace and things like this where it's not quite clear where the money goes. Lack of transparency. <laughs> Introduce transparency uh, and, 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 and take a long-term position on, on how to shore up uh, science, in, 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 especially in a post-Brexit world. David. Uh, wow. <laughs> okay. You know what I would do? And it, it, it won't be done in a day. But I would reform the House of Lords. <laughs> and, uh, and having done that, give it considerably greater power than it currently has to influence uh, policy making. Do you want me to elaborate? Oh. Uh, yes. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, we, we have this tremendous paradox uh, with the House of... We, we, because there is this process of reform which should have been completed, to be honest, in the Blair government that he chickened out, um, that, that, that is it, sort of suspended. Um, and it, 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 it's a complete sort of mishmash. Because on the one hand... <coughs> We have a system whereby, and, and, and this is a, you know, an appropriate thing, that there are appointed people, appointed members, <coughs> uh, and the one who lives just down the road here, uh, like Martin Rees. Um, and, but then on the other hand, we have the political place persons from all political parties, you know, who end up there uh, 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 after having done... Uh, you know, there, there's stint, and, and I, no, you know, I <laughs> the master here. I would not be sent, I'm not buttering up to this gentleman here. I have no reason to butter up to, but he's not one of those. Uh, uh, but, you know, I remember talking with Chris, he, you won't remember this, Chris, a long time ago on, on acid rain issues, for example, when you were MP as Finsbury. Um, but, uh, and then the other thing, uh, dimension I would do, uh, and this is a dilemma uh, which, which faces not Britain but many other countries, um, is how to articulate uh, the recognition of both the local and the national interests. Um, and I would hopefully see a, a much more formalised uh, recognition of the interests of different regions throughout the... OK, UK, maybe part of the UK might go off and so on. Um, and then I think we'd have a very effective body uh, which, which could have a real influence on policy making in, in the way in which we don't. And it will be a true complement to, to the Commons. Thank you, David. And actually, in your Catherine Wheel analogy of earlier, I think you've already spun off a whole to set of topics there, which we might pick up to, uh, again in a minute. But, um, Greg? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I ended with the two things I do. So you put, if I can only do one of them, it's quite tricky. Um, but I think, like, first of all, carbon taxes. Yeah, like, okay, like, so, yeah. and, and it's really interesting. You know, everyone worries about how you do it internationally. The reality is uh, any country that doesn't participate, you carbon tax their exports when they arrive. Um, and it, it doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, I hear all kinds of kind of stories about oh, the disasters this would cause. But uh, look, when the minimum wage was introduced in the UK, um, 
there are a tremendous number of kind of reasons to oppose it about how it would make the poorest people unable to get jobs because the jobs would be too... And it was all nonsense. The reality was it just put a decency floor on our society that I can't imagine anyone ever taking away now. But when the smoking ban was introduced, it was suggested that pretty much every business would fail and no one would ever go to a pub again. And actually pubs became more pleasant places that served food as well as beer. It was fantastic. Uh, so I think um, uh, societal change requires all encompassing measures, carbon tax. Uh, I talked about grids. I, I, I talked about the UK, but pretty much every advanced economy has got a grid that works in the same way. It was designed, they were all designed around basically having big power stations where we've got coal fields and then shipping it to where people live. Uh, obviously, countries with nuclear got added in as well, but that's a very, very different system than we need today. And it has to change for us to move to a low-carbon world, to electrify everything. Um, and uh, there are two countries, by the way, that have taken a bit of a lead. So Brazil and India have contestable grids. So uh, if in India you want to build a wind farm um, and their national grid says it'll take 10 years and cost a certain amount of money, you can build the connections yourself. And it's opening up the ability to dr drive, just drive change. Uh, one thing to be optimistic about, we're seeing a tremendous amount of change already despite these forces um, arrayed against it. 40% of the electricity in the UK is now clean. Sadly, electricity is only 20% of our energy use. So on the one hand, we're doing a great job. On the other hand, we're a fraction of the way, and that's why we need to move fast. The, um, maybe can, can I just pick up? I mean, carbon tax has been talked about for a very, very long time. Um, in fact, actually, I think in one way or another, every single one of the speakers mentioned the need to price externalities as being a critical component. So, I, I mean, Perhaps Greg first, but others do chip in if you if you have thoughts. Why? Why? If everyone nods their heads when you say carbon tax or carbon pricing or some variant thereof, um, why does not happen? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's not conspiratorial. It's just simply organisational theory. Is the incredible lobbying power of the organisations that worry that they'd have to pay a lot of it. But there's going to be a bunch of change, though. If you look at the global oil majors, uh, they're currently you might describe them as being very long cash and very short ideas. And we have a world where those ideas are going to matter more. The understanding of what a future energy system looks like is not a like-for-like -like replacement. Once we electrify transport, it's not cars to cars, it's cars to e-bikes and to scooters. It's cars as energy stores and that you charge them at home, not in petrol. Everything is different. That genie's out of the bottle now. It's a question of how fast it moves. And so I think the, um, uh, the interesting thing that's going to happen um, is that the energy majors sooner or later are going to have to split. Uh, they'll split into the clean co and the dirty co. By the way, they may not, it might be upstream, downstream, but there'll be some format of split. They'll probably do some mega mergers first, and then they'll start splitting so that the clean or downstream companies are big enough to be globally effective. A bit like we saw with airlines, where in the face of the change driven by low-cost airlines, the flag carriers ended up merging, and you ended up with a very a sort of a, a market of, of, bit of a bit of the old ones that had struggled to be relevant and the new ones that had struggled to be big. That's what we'll see in the world of energy. I think as that happens, it, at the moment, no oil company will lobby for electric heat pumps because their future is safer in hydrogen. But as soon as they've split, you'll have one of them lobbying for an electrification future, and one of them becomes, it looks more like tobacco. By the way, if you don't know, tobacco, and I haven't checked this year, but last year, uh, over a 30-year period, the best returns in public stocks were in tobacco because you had very... <laughs> It's very clear what they do, right? They, don't have to, they used to pretend that they didn't kill people, and that was a really difficult job. Once they just kind of admit they kill people, and some people like smoking, and you, know, you have a very clear message between society and the fag industry, that's the kind of thing that's going to happen in the world of fossil fuels eventually. And there'll be perfectly profitable investments, but they'll be shrinking year on year on year on year on year. And meanwhile, the clean companies that are left behind will be growing, and they'll be lobbying for the carbon taxes. I hope it can come sooner than that, but if nothing else, that'll be when it happens. So, I mean, one of the things that you're talking about there is mechanisms to try and unlock and unleash innovation. Um, I, I mean, Anil, what things do you... I mean, you're, you're obviously kind of, you know, in a sense, at the forefront of attempting to mm. generate, a, frankly, quite a disruptive um, input to the marketplace. Um, what do you think are the critical ingredients that could be put in place to really try and unlock the sorts of innovations that are required? 
It's a good question. So I, I, I guess I go back to those old um, martial arts movies. You see someone like Bruce Lee, and there's this kind of one-inch punch delivered. This, this is perfectly targeted strike that somehow takes out the enemy. And it's, it feels a bit like that at the moment. It would be nice to have a big you know, carbon tax and a big movement. But one of the big issues with those, those big political movements is that one country might become uncompetitive if they, if they take a position in this, because other countries who are being bad actors and, and just continue to emit, just refuse, and, uh, and, and they can have cheaper goods. So with the things we're doing, we're trying to identify uh, where is the weak spot that you can strike that would take an existing incumbent market and just tip it over the line to become uncompetitive. Uh, and so, for example, uh, if, you, if you're trying to go up against uh, uh, palm oil, for example, the other big oil, which is leading to loads of deforestation, uh, then you want to look into, for example, some alternative like mixed, uh, mixed forestry uh, cocoa plantations or something that will, that will not uh, 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 cut down those tropical rainforests. But you're not trying to totally finance this new form of agriculture. You're just trying to supply the additional finance required to just make that slightly more uh, 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 profitable than palm oil. And then the local people will take their own decisions about what they're doing. And for there's many, many other areas where uh, you want to find a slight weak spot uh, in, in, in a market that is naturally getting more uncompetitive uh, and just give it that additional finance. Another good example is, is biodiesels, for example. Historically, biodiesels, the, the idea behind this is, oh, don't worry, it's just my, uh, it's just my name badge. No good pronounce it anyway, it's fine. Uh, uh, the, the, the idea about biodiesels is that uh, you want to uh, grow algae, for example, and uh, it will absorb CO2 from seawater. Uh, and then you will use this to construct new fuels, uh, things like HVO, hydrogenated vegetable oil, that can go into existing diesel engines. So you don't need to retrofit um, an, an entire uh, car industry. For example, in, in India, you can just use this new source of, uh, of, of non-fossil fuels to provide uh, that, uh, that, uh, that mechanism. But the historical problem with biodiesels is that they've just been a little bit too, too difficult and too expensive to put together. But if we can do the science to say, well, is there a way to just tip that just slightly more efficient uh, than existing fossil fuel-based diesels, then that feels very viable. So I'm into identifying those uh, weak points uh, that are there and just in the right time and place, provide the finance and the research and the funding and the venture capital uh, to make those practical. And then they will topple entire incumbent industries. Otherwise, as, as Greg said, is, they're just too powerful to... Uh, to tackle head-on. You can't finance an entire multi-trillion dollar uh, uh, diesel industry and, 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 and take it down. We've seen Tesla, for example, trying to take that head-on. So I, I think perhaps letting, letting those kind of electric car companies uh, try the big, the big fight, we need to be more tactical about how we identify these things, break them apart, look for the weak spots, and, uh, and invest in there and, and, and try to disrupt it through that. Could, could, could I just say something yeah. to Anno? You said right at the very beginning, Anno, that you couldn't become Prime Minister of this country because you're an Irish Indian. Oh, yeah? I couldn't think of any better qualification <laughs> for somebody to be Prime Minister of I'd this country. I'd rather be Tishik. <laughs> oh, well. yeah, perhaps I can understand. But I, I think it will be a salutary lesson for this country having colonised both of those <laughs> countries. But you, you would not... Yeah, you, you would be such a wonderful example that even those, you know, I use the term, little Englanders, um, who, for example, delivered the terrible, I think, anyway, circumstances of, on this country in 2016, um, would be, you know, reform their ways and would think what a wonderful example you set from Ireland, being a member of the EU, <laughs> uh, 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 and, you know, well, I I India through its, its wonderful... Uh, role in the Commonwealth and, uh, and, and more generally. So, yeah, let's have an Irish Indian. <laughs> <laughs> but David, more importantly, uh, uh, one, <laughs> get back on topic, one, championing champion science technology. Oh, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, yes. Where, where yes. I will quickly bridge yes. to asking you, um, uh, Greg um, raised this issue of hydrogen and hydrogen for heating in particular and uh, the challenge with, uh, it, you know, what's from uh, an outsider's perspective seems to be a quite a substantial lobbying of uh, political figures associated um, with the hydrogen economy. Um, you've obviously got a significant you know, experience in terms of the uh, your work with the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology in terms of how to bring evidence into um, the, that, that political decision-making process. Right. Uh, I mean, I wonder whether you wanted to comment on 
how to, um, you know, in, in this area where lobbying from vested and incumbent uh, interests is so significant, how you think we, uh, you know, how can that be circumvented? How can that be cut through? Well, um, yes, uh, it, it, the, the truth, and, and I absolutely agree with everything you said, and I, I'm totally with you on this idea of moving to an electrified society. Um, yes, uh, the, 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 I mean, the lo lobbying is there, and it's per to to totally legitimate, I think, for, for companies to place their, 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 their credentials and argue their case, um, particularly because, you know, as you were pointing out, the role they play in generating employment and so forth. Um, the question is, and, and it's an excellent example that you've highlighted, where you've got a, a dilemma. You can't really, some, sometimes it was presented to us, oh, let's have some of everything. Let's have a bit of each. So let's have a bit of hydrogen. Let's have a bit of electrification. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it, it doesn't work like that, I'm afraid. And you, you expect that there will probably be a dominant, in this case, you know, energy delivery system. You, you just, um, and then the question becomes, and again, Greg, you put your finger on it, how, how on earth could there possibly be, be a change? Now, I mean, there are fairly strong uh, lobbying influences that would stand by you and support you in terms of uh, a, a, a movement towards electrification. Um, and I, I think that what we need is, is to strengthen the uh, power of, of Parliament, and I am talking specifically about Parliament here, to ask the right questions of government. I mean, that is the role of Parliament. It's the fundamental role. It's not to pass laws. It's to scrutinise, to ask awkward questions to government and to ministers <laughs> like uh, our beloved master here was, uh, 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 for example. Um, and, and we've got to make certain that the right questions are being asked and emphasised enough. No, no, I mean, these questions are being asked to an extent, but we've got to make certain they're asked louder. And we've got to also, I think, um, you, you said there are examples overseas. Um, there's a sometimes tendency in the British Parliament, I don't know if Chris would agree with me, to say, oh, not invented here sort of thing. Um, but we've got to say, look, sometimes people outside of this country actually get it right, and we've got to learn lessons from them. I think that's also an important message to get across. Um, the final, final topic area that I'd like all, all three of you to perhaps um, comment on, which I think, um, well, if, if first raised by you, um, uh, David, was that you mentioned a, a moment ago the connection between a local and national interest. Um, I mean, clearly, in terms of many of the work that you're doing, Anil, that connection between community level and then global level is critically important. How do we um, understand how to connect the interests at those different levels? Um, and then, in terms of the you know energy systems, actually, there is so you know so much of. Ha you're trying to deliver at a local level, but then actually the national grid infrastructure makes it you know, impossible to do it because the infrastructure is not there, and etc. And, and often the decision-making processes don't connect well between the local and national level. Um, and then similarly on the energy side of things, we're dependent on the global context as well. So I wonder whether each of you want to comment about how do we improve in a decision-making sense um, and policy sense that interconnectedness between each of those different levels. Greg, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, and uh, allow me to confine myself just to energy, even though so many other things are exciting, interesting, and important. Um, uh, but uh, I hesitate to do this. But in 1980, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev came to Britain, and he was being taken around London by Margaret Thatcher. Um, and uh, he said to her, who does the central planning? In the Soviet Union, we have the best economists as central planners, and, and yet there are queues in our shops, there are none here. And she said, well, market forces, price signals. And, and I think, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm no hard thatch right by what I should say, but what underlay that is that in any complex system, optimization is uh, difficult, done centrally. 
And I think in complex system theory, you want optimization at multiple levels. And the first place to optimize is at the very end of the system. Uh, and so in the case of energy, for example, first of all, optimize within a house. Uh, Octopus has just collaborated with an innovative house builder. Uh, by the way, the incumbents didn't do this. The innovative ones did. And now everyone's trying to do it, which is to build zero bills homes. So we've launched homes that will never have an energy bill, which was attractive enough prior to the crisis, but now is not only economically sensible, but resolves an awesome amount of anxiety. Uh, to give the maths on this, by the way, the houses cost, I don't know, £10,000 more to build. The average energy bill in the UK under the government cap is £2,500. It pays for itself in four years. And that is achieved by optimising within the home. They've got solar panels, uh, a heat pump, uh, a battery, and uh, a smart hot water heater, and then um, a, a really sophisticated set of machine learning algorithms, look at the weather forecast, the grid price forecast, and they balance when the generation goes in the battery, when it goes into the heating, when it goes uh, onto the grids, when it comes from the grid into the battery, and, and, and so on. All of that in real time based on weather forecasts and price forecasts. If you optimize at that level, and, and then you get an expert, you know, if you're plugging an electric car and you're optimizing, is the grid going at the car, the car going at the grid, um, how many miles do you need to drive today, tomorrow, next week? What's the weather like today, tomorrow, next week? All those things. You optimize all that at the local level. And you optimize up the system. By the time you get to the top of the system, actually, you've had a tremendous amount of optimization done for you. But today, because we run kind of, I don't know, for those who've done a bit of economics or Soviet history, a sort of God's plan in energy, um, what we end up with is the equivalent of uh, butter mountains, wine lakes, and bread shortages, where we are turning off our wind farms, the clean, cheap electricity, while we're burning coal and gas in another part of the country. Um, and where energy prices, you know, the price we pay, and the government sub scheme is 35 pence a kilowatt hour in the UK, and it costs five pence to generate. All right? That's the system we're in today, and the way to resolve that is by... Uh, optimizing locally all the way up, and that will mean the generation and consumption in a home, the solar farm or the wind farm outside of town, uh, then the solar farms and wind farms on a regional level, then those right up to the scale that I'm really excited. We, we, we backed a project to build a, uh, a colossal solar and wind farm in Morocco, and then a cable to the UK. All right, it's 4,000 kilometers, um, and um, it'll deliver cheaper energy than even a wind farm here reliably 365 days a year, and by the way, provide quite a lot of energy for the Moroccan grid as well. Um, so you really are looking at these solutions that go from an individual house or business all the way up to nations and then internationally. And, and, and the more of it we do, the cheaper and easier it gets. David. Yes, and, and, and people could tan themselves electrically on their beds, and they wouldn't need to fly down to... <laughs> it's to incredible. Get yeah. It's well, a win-win. It's a win -win, yeah. <laughs> yes, funny you should mention M Margaret Thatcher, because um, she actually, uh, you know, had a certain interest in the environment, and I think about 1990, she organised a cabinet seminar on climate change, uh, and I was one of about 30 uh, people, all men, by the way, uh, who were invited to go along. And um, she was sitting in the middle of a long table like this with a cabinet on either side of her, you know, Lawson, Jeffrey Howe, and, uh, and we made our presentations. And at one point, she suddenly stood up. And she looked at them. And she said, you won't understand this. You're not scientists. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. You know, the humiliation. <laughs> she delivered on them. And now I've forgotten what the point of the question <laughs> was, but it was so funny. It was so funny. But no, oh, sorry, the scale. Yeah. Yeah, well, this is um, what I suppose political scientists would call the Burkean dilemma. You know, Edmund Burke's uh, dilemma as, a, uh, as the Bristol MP who is required or expected by the, the electorate to represent their interests and their interests alone in Parliament, but is struggling to take a, a wider national perspective. And, 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 I mean, gosh, I'm not the one, again, the master, uh, although yours was an urban constituency, of course, and it's probably more in the sort of more expansive county areas that you have these dilemmas between, uh, you know, development and, well, let's call it nimbyism. Um, and, and you referred to, to, to an example there. Um, it, it, it is an impossible, 
I, I mean, I don't think there is any overall uh, 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 mechanism to resolve those tensions. They will always be there. I mean, you see some of it now in the discussion about fracking, for example, and then there's a suggestion that if it is to go ahead, it's another matter, um, that there should be uh, local compensation. I mean, that's a, 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 another approach. Would that satisfy, satisfy everybody? Um, can you get an acceptance in local areas about the wider national... Sometimes, sometimes you can. Um, but uh, uh, it, it, it will always be a problem. It possibly resolved, or, or at least ameliorated, uh, I was talking about the House of Lords with a regional representation, um, if we can develop a more effective uh, a, a, a hierarchy of representation, political representation, at different aerial levels. Um, I think that could make a big contribution as well. Uh, and, and Neil, I mean, power of technology to try, yeah. and, to try and solve some of these really otherwise challenging... It, it, it is. It's interesting. As a technologist, I worry less about the technology and more about what kind of world we're trying to build. So if we project forward to, say, 20 years from now, and we have this vast amount of energy that, uh, that Greg describes, and, and, and we've, we've uh, we figured out how to, how, to, how to make this better. Are we building a more equal world where there's egalitarian access to this um, uh, across everyone? And, and of course, the huge divide here is the global north and the global south. So there's this, been this colonial cost of capitalism that uh, I, we, we joked about me being a, a child of colonialism, but uh, it, all of India's economic output and, uh, uh, until 1947 was, was ascribed to, to building that economic engine of, of the United Kingdom. And so who should be to blame for the historical emissions of, of India before independence? It, it really is this enormous cumulative debt that uh, the, the, the developed world has built up and, and one that we're trying to repair now. So one of the, the goals of, of carbon finance at a very high level is to channel money from the, the north to the south uh, to help the developing world essentially leapfrog one layer of technology. So if you look at something completely different, look at um, internet access, for example. We went through this process of having little modems connect up through the telephone lines and asking your parents to not pick up the phone when we're connecting to the internet. Uh, and then we had slow DSL and then broadband and then we, we, we built up to Wi-Fi and to 5G and so on and so forth. When you go to India, they just totally skipped entire generations of this. They, they never dug up the streets. They just went straight for high-powered 3G masts and gave access to, uh, to uh, millions and billions of, uh, of the population because they could, they could take advantage of the investments that uh, the North made in these things and then deploy the best of uh, uh, whatever was there uh, and, and say, essentially save lots of money in, in, in that R&D. And I'm hopeful that we can apply the same principles to, uh, to for example, for, to carbon finance and to, to green electricity. Because what we're trying to do is think about how to do local to local connections where whenever one of us causes some climate damage, how do you, how do you have an equivalent benefit? Uh, sure, in terms of carbon emissions and biodiversity, but fundamentally in terms of benefits and local livelihoods in the global south. Someone there has to make um, money that is balancing out the, the shared benefit to our economic well-being here due to this, uh, this, uh, this, this engine we've built through, through fossil fuels. So before anything else, we've got to figure out, is this technology answering the basic questions of, is it flattening uh, access uh, to the world to this technology that is powered through green energy and then results in all of these new great intellectual uh, advancements? And I believe we are through carbon finance. It's, the current system is flawed, but we're getting better and better at tracking the flows of money uh, in order to figure out, for example, uh, right now, if you, if you buy carbon credits, maybe 90% of it goes through to middle brokers. Uh, but we, we're building the direct payment technologies to, to figure out um, how to get 90% directly to that landowner in Sierra Leone uh, that, uh, that, that needs to uh, achieve that benefit. If you can flip that equation by using transparent global uh, uh, electronic payment mechanisms, then we've totally transformed the question. Technology is now contributing towards the flattening um, of, uh, and accessibility of, of the Global South, being financed by the Global North without requiring large-scale policy shifts. This is simply corporations, the economic engines of the planet uh, that are currently dominated uh, in the North are just paying a carbon tax through carbon credits, but channeling that money not to the good hands of Liz Trust to, to spend as she sees fit, 
but directly and verifiably to the south where we know that reparations are required because we want them to, uh, to, to, to leapfrog uh, fossil fuels and uh, uh, bad solar panels to the best of breed, for example, that uh, the Greg is, is putting together with, uh, with, uh, with Octopus and, and, and these sort of technologies and avoid lobbyists and all those incumbents that we have here because there's, there's, a, there's a green world of economic um, opportunity, obviously, in the, in the developing south. To put it in context, if we save the rainforests, in Indonesia, Madagascar, the Amazon, Congo, and Colombia. I'm looking at Emily Lines here to, to see if I've got that right. Those five represent 80% of the world's biodiversity, and all of those countries are, represent a really, really downtrodden, uh, 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 highly interfered with government, sh should I say, to put it politely, from, uh, from, from very, various colonial forces. And, and so we have to undo that damage without us actually try to drop in as, uh, uh, as, as, as white knights yeah. from, uh, from the north and, and let them make their own decisions, but provide them with all of this, these innovations that we're, uh, we're building on, on the forefront. So I worry less about technology, more about making sure that we're trying to connect that technology to short circuit this equality issue in the, uh, uh, the, the, that we've been facing for, for, well, for the last uh, two or three centuries. Okay, excellent. So we leave uh, this discussion on the topic of climate accessibility again. Mm. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you.